Hello, you little gremlins. Tis I, Antonio D'Amico. This is Pointy Hat, and welcome to D&D with a Twist. The show where I take a D&D thing, could be a class, nope, could be a monster, kinda, or it could be a race, yes. It's like a Digimon digivolving into a new, different little beast. Except here, instead of taping more guns to a little animal and giving it a longer name, it's... Well, it's sort of like that, now that I think about it. So when I think of goblins, I think of... Rats, we're rats, we're the rats. We pray at night, we stalk at night, we're the rats. I'm the giant rat that makes all of the rules. Let's see what kind of troll we can get ourselves into. Goblin is the race for raccoon kin and rabiosexuals. Goblins are basically little mousy boys that love murder and are really good at crime. They are the most chaotic of all races, and not chaotic in the D&D sense of the word, but more in the internet sense of the word. They are just tiny little guys that enjoy messing stuff up for everyone else, which is why goblins are the race that is most often listed in the races they don't like section of literally every other race in D&D. Ew, I like them. I like goblins. They are described as having big pointed ears, big eyes, pointy teeth, and basically flat noses like Voldemort. In terms of skin tone, goblins vary a lot. Goblins are green if you're correct, or human colored or reddish skin if you have bad taste. They are either the cutest thing in D&D, and the equivalent of a green little pug, or the ugliest, dirtiest, grimiest of boys, depending on the artist depending if you're a weirdo. They are one of the small races, standing at an imposing three to three and a half feet, around one meter for those of you that use the correct system, which means you are just worse than a medium creature. <laughs> okay, time for a little soapbox section. I love 5e, but one of the things that bothers me about the small races is that they used to have disadvantages like they do now, but also advantages that would make up for that. As of now, there's plenty of disadvantages, like you're not able to wield two-handed weapons at all, you have to wield versatile weapons with two hands, you are worse at jumping, and whenever you cast a spell like this guy's self, your options are severely limited. And what do the short kings among us get for this? Well, you can occupy the space of a creature twice your size, so not medium creatures, which are the most common creatures after all, and that's it. Yes, you may be able to fit somewhere that a human or other medium creature can't, but that's such a small advantage compared to what you lose. Even the dwarf, the literal poster boy for short kings, is counted as a medium creature because being a small creature sucks. <laughs> Wizards, please fix this. Give the little mousy boy a boost. Wait, wait, no, 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 I didn't mean it like that. No, 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 not like a booster seed, like, oh god. But maybe goblin subraces change the appearance of the goblin in significant ways? Nope. In terms of goblin subraces for 5th edition, there are some, technically? In older editions, there were many different types of goblins, but they were never meant to be playable characters. Just grunks to mow through. When it comes to actual sub-races that you play, most of the official ones come from those tie-in settings with Magic the Gathering released for free, and they are more about who goblins are and what their culture is about in a given setting, with some minor ability changes, so not much there. A uh, fun little footnote though is that one of the only official goblin sub-races comes from a coloring book wizards did for charity. It's cute. Look at it. It's called Adventures with Muck. No, not that one. The subrace in it is described as being gentler and more artistic than your general goblin and is called Dankwood Goblin. Dank. Smoke weed every day. In the re-release of Goblins for Monsters of the Multiverse, the goblin is included with no sub-races. So yeah, not much to see here with regards to goblin sub-races yet. So what about goblin abilities? Surprisingly, the goblin is the only one of the small races that actually gets something out of being small. And that's because of its signature ability. Let's get into it. If you're using racial ability scores, goblins gain a plus two to dexterity and a plus one to constitution. Pretty solid in terms of increases. Dex is a useful ability score for literally any class, since it dictates your AC unless you're wearing heavy armor and your initiative, and it's the most common save in the game, and Khan literally decides your HP, which is kind of important for all characters, you know, so you don't die. Let's get the boring stuff out of the way. Your speed is 30, making you quite speedy for a small race, your size is small, as we mentioned before, and you can speak goblin. <laughs>
Neat. Now for the spicier stuff. Dark Division allows you to see in the dark, just like orcs, elves, babies, your sister, and all living beings except for cats. Nimble Escape gives you a baby version of the rogue's cunning action, allowing you to disengage and hide as a bonus action, but not dash. This is kind of weird, as goblins seem built to be used as rogues, and it will make this feature literally useless. But hey, if you plan to go against type, at least you get this. And finally, the goblin's signature ability, Fury of the Small. Fury of the Small is basically the best case for small characters, and it's only available to goblins, so dwarves can suck it! I didn't mean it, sweetie. You're still my favorite. I'm so sorry, baby. Fury of the Small allows you to deal extra damage each time you inflict damage on a creature, regardless of its source. So it could be a weapon attack, a spell, you biting the creature's ankle like the greasy little goblin you are, anything. This used to be equal to your level, but you were only able to do it once per short rest. Now you can do it an amount of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and the damage is also equal to your proficiency bonus. This change happened in Monsters of the Multiverse. And you know what else changed? They gave the goblins a new ability. Goblins now get Fey and Ancestry. Just like elves, you have advantage on avoiding or ending the charmed effect. But why exactly do goblins get fey ancestry? Well, let's answer that by getting into the lore of the race. Goblin lore and culture are not very deep. At least until now, the god of the goblins is Maglubli. Maglubiet. Maglubiet. Thanks, wizards. Thanks for that. Maglubiet is just awful in general, but he's particularly awful to goblins. It's said he basically made their culture what it currently is. Goblins are structured in tribes, and they are bad. In goblin tribes, goblins learn that nobody will help them and that everyone, including other goblins, will try to put them down so that they can ascend to the upper echelons of the tribe, and that they should therefore do the same if they don't want to be trampled by the other goblins. They are forced to fight, live in strictly hierarchical societies that are basically a caste system that pretends you can go up in rank and are actively discouraged from helping each other. They are rewarded for treating other goblins below them in the worst way possible and are encouraged to rise through the ranks with violence, trickery, or worse. Because goblin society tends to favor the strongest and because hobgoblins and bugbears live among goblins, most goblins are at the very bottom of the goblinoid hierarchy, which means that their lives are as awful as they can possibly be. Goblin culture also doesn't have the societal structure for them to, I don't know, keep cattle, tend to crops, do normal things like a society should do. So they of course rely on stealing and pillaging and raiding for supplies. Or worse, they take... You know about YouTube. Interns? You know, where they put people of other races in an internship against their will. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And because goblin society is about treating the person below you as bad as possible on your way to the top, this means that goblins treat their interns worse than anyone else. It's bad. Okay, we get it. Goblin culture is awful. But what was that about fey ancestry? Well, here's the thing. Remember when I listed all of Maglubiet's boring evil god characteristics? Turns out, he's not as basic as you thought he was. Or as I thought he was. I sure did ignore this guy for the entirety of the time I played D&D. Until now, he took the god of conquest thing very seriously. Maglubiet wasn't originally the god of goblins or of any other goblinoid. He conquered them. Before being conquered by Maglubiet, all goblinoids lived in the Feywild. Goblins, hobgoblins, and bugbears were all Fey. This is also why all three of the goblinoid races have gotten Fey ancestry as a racial ability, and it's also probably why these three completely different races that don't look even a little bit related are all classified under goblinoid. They are not actually related. Back before the rise of Maglubiet, goblins served the Queen of Air and Darkness, the Archfey Queen of the Unseelie Court in the Feywild. And side note here, I've been preparing a huge video for the Feywild. I'm talking insanely big. My original plan was to have it ready for 50k subscribers, but then we got there in like four months, so I'm shooting for 100k. I'll get more into the Archfey and all of that then. For now, all you need to know is that they served the Unseelie Queen, and apparently it was her that gave them this signature ability few of the small as a boon. Neat. The rise of Maglubian resulted in the goblin gods dying at the hands of the conqueror god, and him taking the three goblinoid races for himself. This is why Maglubian doesn't care about goblinoids and only uses them as pawns in his war. Hell, it's said that when goblins die, their souls go on to fight for Maglubian, and they are so scared of this that they fear it worse than death. This is also why goblinoid society is structured the way it is. Goblins dying just means more troops for Maglubian in the war he cares about, and a god of war and Conquest and Bad cares a negative amount about those that worship him being seen as productive members of society by other people. So why would he incentivize goblins to stop relying on raids and thievery and 
In turns, keeping goblins and all other goblinoids as pawns is what Maglubiot wants. Goblins are not Maglubiot's children, they are his property. He killed their gods, stole them from their home in the Feywild, brought them to the material realm, and convinced them that this horrible hierarchy that he has them under is the only way they'll be able to survive. It's awful, but also really cool. So yeah, goblins just got way more interesting. Everybody go thank the mom book for that. So yeah, those are goblins. We've looked at their appearance, their abilities, their lore, their culture, and that's nice and all. But what if we gave goblins a new twist? So you want to play a goblin. Your brain run by goblin. Pull him out and beat him. Goblins are tiny little gremlins that are really good at crime and being annoying. Before we get into the twist proper, let's talk a bit about the function of goblins in the game. Goblins were conceived as cannon fodder for DMs to throw at players that they could kill with no moral questions asked, and their culture was presented as like, the worst possible culture in existence, so that players felt okay with, you know, throwing them into a wood chipper or whatever. What ended up happening is that with ideas shifting, the game growing older, and many players being more interested in exploring questions about the different races, and so many artists drawing goblins as so gosh darn cute, more and more goblins were being played as characters. There was more of a need to know more about them, for their lore and culture to be explored deeper, for them to be something a bit more interesting than just tiny little crime boys that love to be evil, or rather, the option to be that or something else. And before now, there really wasn't an official answer to that in the lore. This explanation would have ended there, but the mom book kinda changed that completely. By giving goblin lore a tangible origin and explaining the true role that their evil means god plays with regards to all goblinoids, they've really opened the door to many different storylines and questions to goblins that I find, like, really, really interesting. Maglubia directly benefiting from goblins living by this horrible, evil, hierarchical structure is a really solid idea that doesn't mess with the established goblin conventions and allows you to explore that in your games if you want to. Hell, Maglubia was presented as a conqueror god in the first edition of D&D, but we just never knew what exactly he conquered. We just knew that, like, like that was his hobby or something. But now we know. It also makes sense with, like, actual real-world folklore. The word goblin can be traced to, like, half of Western Europe, but they are often seen as part of the Fae, so it very much tracks to put their origins in the Fae Wild in D&D. And the best part of this is that this update doesn't, like, turn goblins into halflings or whatever. I wouldn't like the change if updating the lore would strip goblins of their vibe. Goblins are lovable and fun because of this chaotic, messy, kinda gross, kinda cute vibe. And this update does not do away with it. You can very much still play and encounter the chaotic, rat, raccoon, little green people beloved by all, but you can also empathize with them and their plight and maybe help them. Or you know, you can still throw them into the wood chipper if that's the game you want to play, but now you have choices. It's about choices, people. Choices. So yeah, on the whole, I'm super, super down with this update to goblins. I think there are things still to explore and now goblins feel like they could honestly carry a whole book on their own for these questions to be answered in text longer than like the paragraph they get in the mom book. But yeah, pretty impressed with the change. I can certainly think of other franchises that use goblins in their world with much, much worse implications. But now, we have a problem. See, making goblins related to the Feywild and their history being about being torn apart from their roots and forced to serve a conquering god that doesn't have their best interests in mind, that's very much my brand. That's what we do here. This is what this show is about. This is my turf. And I don't appreciate people stepping on my turf. So what do we do to give goblins a twist like we do here when they were just given a twist? Well, because as I said, I really like the twist. What if we build on this twist? What if we go further than the little blurb we got in Monsters of Multiverse? What if we played with the ramifications of the new lore? We know that elves made their way to the material plane, but the Eladrin stayed in the Feywild. So why couldn't some goblins stay? Eons ago, when the races of men were still new, goblins lived among the other fae in the Plain of Fairy. They served the unseelie court of the Queen of Air and Darkness, who I swear I'll get to when I do a Feywild video, please just wait. The goblins lived in shadow, and their queen had granted them many boons, allowing them to move unseen and strike down foes much bigger than them, and they returned this favor by serving the unseelie queen well. This way of life changed when the conqueror god Maglubiot came into the Plain of Fairy and killed the gods of goblins, tearing them from their homeland to be used as pawns in his war. But the queen of the unseelie did not sit idly by and let this happen. See, 
She is the queen of air and shadow, after all, and so she used her powers to conceal some of her goblin subjects, shielding them from Myglubiot. And so these goblins remained in the Feywild while their brethren were torn and transported away into an alien plane. The shadow and air that shielded them from the eye of Maglubiot, along with their prolonged stay in the Feywild, changed them from the goblins that now inhabit the material plane. Without any gods of their own, most of them became even more loyal to the queen that had saved them from Maglubiot, with many serving as the keepers of her throne and her house, guarding her from anyone that wanted to harm her, and using their talents for hiding and duplicity as spies. Nowadays, these Feywild goblins are called Brownies, and just like the Eladrin, they are related but different to the goblins that can be found in the Material Plane. Those that remain loyal to the Queen of Air and Darkness are still at her side and are seen as the servants of her house, but there are many that have struck on their own, living up to the love of freedom that is characteristic of the Feyfolk. All Brownies have the same gifts from the Queen, regardless if they serve her or not. This gift is an embodiment of the ever-changing nature of the Feywild. Just like the Aladdin change seasons depending on their mood, the Brownies change abilities depending on if they stand in shadow or in light. Some Brownies even report their feelings changing depending on the light or the absence of it, becoming bolder while in bright light, and more duplicitous when in shadow. Brownies are known to be particularly grateful, a cultural aspect that comes directly from being saved from Maglubiot by the Queen of Air and Darkness. Saving a Brownie from a premature death is said to grant you that Brownie services until they feel their debt is repaid. When in good spirits, they are eager to please and will do their best to help those they like. But sliding a brownie is a great way to make an enemy for life, as they'll put as much effort in making your life a living hell if they feel you were disrespectful or ungrateful towards them. Keeping a brownie happy, however, is easier said than done, as the customs of the Feywild and of brownies in particular are extremely alien to anyone that doesn't know their culture intimately. A brownie could make her way to the material plane and run into an orchard there, and she might feel extremely grateful towards a farmer that owns said orchard. She will then decide to help the farmer from the shadows doing chores for him and helping him around the house. But if a farmer does something to offend the brownie, even completely unintentionally, the brownie will then proceed to make his life as awful as possible. It's through this need to be grateful and useful to someone that has done them a great service that many brownies find themselves traveling the world going on adventures, whether they run into an adventuring party that saves them from certain doom, or they want to help someone they feel grateful towards by going on said adventure. Many brownies start their journeys out of a feeling of gratitude. And there you go! Those are brownies. The Goblin Eladrin. The Goblin Adrin. The Gobladrin. You get it. D&D Fae kind of have a Scottish fairy thing going on with the Seelie and the Unseelie courts, so I thought I would do the same and be inspired by actual Scottish brownies. In folklore, brownies are said to do chores and help you out around the house, but are also extremely touchy and very easily offended. So I thought making that a cultural trait will make for some great starts to characters. It also ties in so well with them being grateful to the Unseelie queen for saving them, which is why I made it so that they're considered the servants of her house. Like, they help her out. <laughs> like, they protect her and they are her guard but they also help her out by tidying stuff up since, you know, she doesn't have arms or feet or a face. So yeah, go out there, make your weird little goblin man boy thing, and torture your friends with the weirdest voice you can come up with. And that's it! You did it, I did it, we made it to the end of the video. I love goblins a lot, and I feel like so does most of the D&D community, so this video was kind of stressful to make. I hope I succeeded in making it cool. I wanted to talk about the new changes to goblins because I really like them, but I'm really interested in seeing if y'all agree or not, and also why. I also really hope you like the brownies. I had a ton of fun with them, and I would love to revisit them in the future. I think they could make for great adventure starters as well as PCs, and also great NPC companions to be honest. I think it'd be funny to come up with a bunch of things that brownies find extremely rude or extremely polite, and seeing the party try to piece together what the hell the little green rat man means when he says that eating frozen peas on a Friday is tantamount to calling his mother a pet rock. Like, that's a cool thing to roleplay at the table, I think. Okay, so the channel is growing a lot, but we're still very, very new, like five months new, in fact. So thank you to everyone that has been sharing the video, liking it, subscribing to it, to me, not the video. You can't subscribe to videos. Anyway, thank you for doing the things, and if you want to do it, and you haven't done it already, please go ahead and do it, too. Thank you. <laughs> All right, enough rambling. See you soon. Don't let the goblins bite. Take care of your little green men. Be kind to rats. Bye. Mwah.